Today's session. Right. Um, so, so uh, Samir and and I and and anybody at this point, um, you know, if there are comments or questions, uh, um, we're we're open to that. We have up to I guess uh, you know to, to the top of the next hour uh, to uh, chat as we like, and then uh, as soon as we run out of questions and comments, we'll transition right away again to the hands-on portion. But uh, please, if you have um, we, we, we had you know, some very nice comments already. If there are other people, you know, from, from Charles Perkins, and we, if there are other people who you know, want to say something uh, as opposed to ask a question, we would be very interested in that as well. You know, for us, these sessions are wonderful as an opportunity to, you know, get impressions, get guidance from people who might consider using our, our work or who are using it and see ways to improve it or or see that it is working well so that we can keep going. And so, uh, you know, now is the time to speak up if you have such comments or questions. Thank you. Hey, hey Mike, this is Jörg Poblonski from Boeing. Um, yeah, hey, Jörg. Really enjoyed the first day. Um, I was talking with some of the folks from uh, the Boeing's team that's running our clusters and, uh, question came up with regard to SPAC and how to deal and, and how you guys might be using SPAC to um, make it easier to install, for example, the intercompilers, like licensed compilers mm -hmm. right. and tools. Right. Kind of how right. do you deal with right. keeping the installations of all those compilers um, on your systems. Um, from what I'm hearing, it's not, intercompilers are not necessarily great with regard to, I want to keep five versions of the compiler and not just the latest because some users are using an older version and they don't wanna switch or they want to make the decision when to switch. So yeah. um, kind of any guidance yeah. <clears throat> around yeah, that? So, yeah, that's a great. So, so Samir, you probably have the most yes. experience with this, please, you know, go So uh, Intel uh, <clears throat> has, a, has a new set of compilers called One API. And with that, you, the issues with the licensing have been resolved. And uh, anybody can use the SPAC package called Intel one API compilers, Intel dash one API dash compilers, and just do a SPAC install on that with just uh, uh, the regular set of uh, directives such as the version and so on. And you can install multiple copies of the compilers and also their MPI and other stacks from one API. They are all available through SPAC uh, in their own hierarchy. Now, if you have an older version of SPAC uh, of Intel compilers already installed, you can just do your you know, module load for that Intel 19.1 or some version. And then you can say SPAC external find and it will locate the Intel compilers. It will find it. It will put it in the compilers.yaml file where it is a table of all the compilers and versions that it maintains. So then you can use the Intel at you know 19.1 as an earlier compiler. But going forward, I would just encourage you to start using the one API and uh, our singularity container, uh, as well as our E4S for AWS already has the one API latest uh, compilers integrated in it. So you can, you can use it from there as well. So both options right. are available for older ones and the newer ones. Does that, yeah, uh, does course. that, yeah, does that address your question? Sure. Yeah, that definitely addresses it. And I was talking with with the HBC team, like, yeah. well, maybe using the containers, we, we still have to figure out how we can get our information security folks to agree that we can use a container that comes from somewhere else. Right. But the fact that you guys yeah. pushed Intel probably to support SPAC 
for installing their compilers, that's already a big help for us. So yes. thank and, you. And, and, and a couple of points, you know, speaking more broadly is, um, for, first of all, on the vendor side, I, I won't say who, but we're having conversations with another HPC vendor to, to see if we can have some synergies, uh, you know, a kind of confluence of products uh, that are using the same workflow you know, from E4S and from the vendor, because, you know, the vendor themselves, they're, they're you know, they, they want to get their latest uh, uh, capabilities into the computing facilities. And they see some of the channels that we're creating with E4S, and they're attracted by the possibility of using some of the same workflows and tools that we're using to get their latest capabilities in place. And so, you know, an example, the one API example that Samir mentioned using SPAC is consistent with how we're doing it with E4S. And so those two, uh, you know, really quite distinct efforts still blend together very nicely. So I, I'm hopeful that we can do something similar, you know, with other commercial products. You know, again, not that we're taking ownership for them or anything at all, but they have a workflow that's compatible with ours, or we have one that's kind of compatible with theirs, however you want to look at it. Um, but that, that 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 possibility is there. And so we want to explore that as, again, as part of our business model for E4S. Um, uh, let's see, The I was going to mention uh, one more thing. Oh, uh, software quality assurance is another area where we've just really started to look at you know what E4S itself can do to improve software quality insurance assurance, and what I'm I'm referring to your comment about you know your your system administrators taking in a container that's that's from the outside, um, and the concerns around that we we get that you know uh, especially at the uh, you know the national security labs that's a big deal for us as well. On the other hand, you look at this the you know the software stack of almost any application nowadays. And a huge portion of the software infrastructure that's underneath that application is open source software. And so we've got to figure this out. We can't just you know dis, uh, disregard open source or stop updating when new new things come in. We have to figure out how we can improve software quality assurance as a part of our efforts. Well, uh, glad to hear that, Mike, and definitely big concern to us and yeah. I was actually just talking with some of my colleagues on the defense side that there's a lot of discussions about how much the solar wind stuff exactly is gonna yeah, yeah. accelerate yep. the discussion about how yeah. can we be more sure we know what's in these packages that are yeah. coming from yeah. from the outside. Yeah. Right. And so and, yeah, a exactly. So can be appreciated. Yeah. yeah. And we would actually really enjoy having a conversation with you about the high priority things. Um, you know, we we certainly can do things like you know digital signing of binaries and things like that. That's that's I think pretty straightforward uh, to do infrastructure wise. Um, I'm actually very interested in things you know where you know, if you've worked with, you know, GitHub and you, you know, you've had these uh, Dependabot uh, messages sometimes, you know, they warn you about versions that have, you know, known security issues. They'll give you a, you know, rating of the security concern. Uh, and then they'll even, you know, offer a patch to you. Um, you know, now we, I don't want to get, I don't think we want to get into that business with E4S, but one thing we can do is, you know, it, it's really hard to find uh, bugs at scale. You know, we, we've had bugs where, you know, they only start appearing at 5,000 processors, you know, MPI processes right, at, at a time. And, it, and often it ends up being some kind of race condition that is so rare that it just takes that many processes for it to be realized. Um, but, but once you find that and fix it, you would like to get that out to people so that they know about it. And so one of the things I, I want to explore as we go forward is a kind of, you know, registry and notification system so that, you know, as we find issues that, that occur uh, at, with performance or correctness at scale, that we can get the word out about that. Because uh, I think those things are hard to find. In fact, I know there are still things in the MPI stack that if you use specific MPI functions and, and you do it in a way that it's a tremendous performance uh, hit, 
And it only occurs at thousands of processes because the underlying algorithm that's being used by a particular MPI implementation switches to something that they thought was going to be better, but in fact was far worse. Um, so these are the kinds of things I think we can try to address too um, around you know, software quality. Hi, this is uh, Uday from GM. And I think, <clears throat> you know, speaking also for the industry and the concerns that you are mentioned are clearly on our side as well, security, but also licenses, yeah. right? I mean, <clears throat> if, we, if we were to bring one of these packages inside our clusters, um, we want to make sure we're not yeah. breaking any licensing or yeah. we would have to go and um, get the licensing. That's, right. This is one thing. And then the second thing is, um, uh, you know, maintenance and, and help. Um, yep. And I know that you, you were um, talked yesterday that that was something you're thinking of, but on the, on the commercial side, you know, we definitely yep. will want to see maintenance and help yep. available, right? Yeah, yeah, a, a few thoughts there. Again, we can't promise anything, but models that have, at this point we can't, we're, we're, but we're certainly aware of it is that, you know, models that do work in the HPC industry are, for example, uh, you know, Kitware, um, you know, has a particular, you know, business model where they take open source, often, you know, a lot of it's DOE collaborative developed uh, software and uh, support uh, people who want to use it. TechX is another company that does similar kinds of things. And there are other companies out there as well. And, and so one of the models we're, we're looking at is to explore that possibility uh, with some of our, our work. Um, it, it's really hard to argue, you know, that that it's within DO's direct staff funding scope to to provide that kind of support. You, you know, just just where where it's primarily about you know supporting the user um, who's outside the labs. I, I I hope you appreciate that that business model is hard to justify. You know, there not that we can't. I mean, what we're doing right now is a collaborative thing. We we pre, we want to do that. It helps both. Um, you know, participants, uh, you know, folks at the lab and, you know, funded by the labs and, and commercial, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, staff, you know, collaborate in that. Um, but then when it gets to more kind of very support oriented work, we, we think that's very important and we, we want that and we need that, um, but we have to find a good business model for that. And, and I think there are some out there and, and I think that we have a very good chance to extend the existing business models and provide a similar kind of support for you for us. Yeah, I, I think you you hit the nail on the head. I yeah. think, uh, for example, open form use open source, yeah. but we do pay a vendor or yeah. maintenance support, right? right? I mean, that's the kind of right. model. And yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm with you about collaborative um, effort because I think um, you're exploring a space that um, <clears throat> You know, educates us on how we could be more efficient um, and and yeah. use the new tools. So there is definitely yeah. value. But if you want to take yeah. wholesale something that you developed and ingest it into our business, um, <clears throat> you know, licensing, security, and maintenance and support right. are right. clearly right. Um, four right. things we need. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And as far as licensing goes, uh, we pay very close attention to that. Um, you know, you know for, for in the early part of my career, I worked on, Trili you know, I, I, I led the Trilinos project, which is a collection of open source uh, libraries. And we, we paid very close attention to licensing issues. Uh, and, you know, we started off with LGPL because that's what DOE would allow us to do, you know, the, which is a, you know, copy lefting, uh, you know, a type of model where, you know, you're, it, so it, it makes, it gets lawyers involved, which is what we don't want to have happen. You want the license to be transparent and, and you know, sh sure enough that you don't have to get the lawyers involved in any direct situation. Um, nothing against lawyers, um, but uh, you know. But then we transitioned to a you know BSD license, which is a permissive license, and then we didn't have to have um, that concern. You know, that our our especially our commercial partners under creative programs, for example, cooperative research and development agreement. 
um, they, they were much more comfortable with that approach. Um, and then we also have users who are just very diligent about looking at header files of our entire source tree and finding language that was inconsistent with um, you know, our, our BSD license. And then they would tell us, hey, you know, you're screwing up here. Um, so so um, and, and we would again welcome any messaging like that, where if you're looking at you know, the product that we have, um, and you're worried about the licensing model that is being used, we, we would like to know about that because uh, we have relicensed. And in fact, through the span of ECP so far, we've relicensed a number of products because of this concern. Uh, we, you know, the, the SPAC has been relicensed. They have now, you know, multi-license approach. Uh, Apache is one of them, one of the options. Um, and then Hyper, which is a scalable solver library, has relicensed itself uh, from LGPL to I can't if one of the more permissive license. I can't remember which one anymore. So we are open to this uh, possibility of relicensing. So if if we wanted to use Nalu Win, for example, mm -hmm. inside of our cluster here at GM. Yeah. Um, there should be no issues with that. It's open source package, which has uh, uh, the full packages available on GitHub with a permissive license. And you should be able to just deploy the container that we have. Okay. And, and I think uh, Samir, you covered some of the packages uh, yes. that can be deployed to containers yesterday. There's a list of three or four of them, right? The application packages. Are all yeah. of them? One was an FEA one, um, and I forget the other one was the geological. Um, so all right. of the packages that I covered yesterday, you should be able to just grab the source from the GitHub repo and just use it with a permissive license. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Those are excellent statements and questions. Um, if this is here one more time from Boeing. Um, yeah. So I saw that you had um, packages for both uh, AWS and Google um, kind of uh, pre-built, not for Azure. Any reason? Yeah. Anything you can comment on that or? So we do have this? plans to uh, target Azure as well. We've started some conversation with Azure. It's just a question of getting the resources sanctioned and, and uh, underway. They are considering our request right now for uh, cooperation with our team. And I'm hoping that uh, soon you should hear that uh, we also support Azure. I'd like to okay. follow up with a question. Are there any other of the uh, larger providers that you are looking to support in that direction? Uh, we are looking at how we can bring external commercial resources in, and this would be a particular advantage in choosing a commercial resource for computation. Sure, we are also in talks with the IBM Cloud so we, we have uh, AWS, which is our primary uh, demo instance, but we also have support for GCP and, and we'll soon have uh, uh, you know, a release on the other cloud providers as well. Wonderful, thank you. Um, there's a, a question in the chat from Thomas uh, Robinson. Are there example Docker files and singularity uh, def files available for building software. I need a container that has MPICH and NetCDF Fortran. So having an example file would be very helpful. Yes, so you, we do yeah. have uh, we do have examples. In fact, in our <laughs> slides, you can see that uh, we presented an example using just SuperLU and uh, you know PetC and some hand hand-picked uh, solvers. I also have in the AWS instance that you can log into uh, an example of uh, Nalu Wind 
being built from a scratch and i'll i'll start the hands on session with where we left off yesterday where we were able to build the docker container with the spack recipe where we have specific uh, uh, packages listed over there so i just picked three packages over there where we said we'll install tau and nalu wind and exa wind and nothing else and create a custom container using our build cache in the same way you could just edit those three lines and just say that i am interested in net cdf fortran and mpitch is already there by default in the environment so mm. you just have to put that in and maybe pull in the spack package for your application and then you'll be able to build the docker container as well as the singularity container using that <laughs> recipe right there i think you, if you go to the exawind dash containers directory in the home directory that's where you'll find the build scripts with the, a spack.yaml file now that spack.yaml file is really important because that lays out the contents of uh, the dependencies and versions of various packages and then you will see that we already have mpitch installed over there and so it's just a question of adding the other spack packages and what variants you want to enable and then you should be on on your way does so, that help answer your question Tom? are are those are are those examples available anywhere other than on the 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 cluster yes uh, they they are available and uh, let me just uh, uh, find you a uh, the exact slide where uh, mike showed this yesterday and i so uh, we do have here let me just go to a web page and then put it in the chat window okay thank you yeah cuz i i mean i'm i've been doing trying to do this from scratch and using e4s sounds like it would be a lot simpler than starting from you know a fresh centos 7 container or something like that yes of course uh, <laughs> and if, if you uh, look at the chat window let me just get the chat window here and if i look at this uh, github tree there are some docker recipes for various uh, packages and uh, if you see the slide number 82 from our slide deck which shows how exactly to build a, a super lu distribution so i'm using say ubi 7 and uh, just in the docker area are uh, are the slides available somewhere yes the slides are available and uh, they are there the link is there from our main uh, yeah i think it's at the iw21 yeah. web page i have just posted yeah. the web yeah, page if you can see okay yeah, if you can see the screen and screen to yeah it's uh, right on the got it yeah splash slide there and here is a specific example of uh, a container <laughs> that was built using uh, the super lu and you can see the docker file that's listed here how we load the packages how we copy over contents create the example and which files to enable and if you want to see a specific recipe of how this is uh, being used i'm just putting that from the slide number 82 in here Do you see the spack dot yaml that I just posted in the super lu example? Yes. <clears throat> so that could so, be a good starting point. You could create a container with super lu. Yeah. And then just to get rid of all the super lu pet c m f m, and then just put in your net cdf and some other examples and right. start with that. Um. What um. <clears throat> so this is set up for for GCC. 
is it yes. simple to use one API? Like, is there is there an E4S container that I can start with that has the one API compilers installed on it, or will I have to spec install that? So, and you could spec uh, one API now, right? Yes, and uh, our main container that uh, we were using yesterday already has one API installed in it. It has 2021.1 version in the opt Intel one API directory. So it has the full stack there. You can just say, you know, SPAC compiler find and get that version, use that SPAC uh, compiler designation in the spac.yaml file that I just showed you. Right. And then instead of GCC, you'll be using Intel. Right. Now, while this is externally installed, this is a good representation of a typical HPC system where some system administrator has installed Intel compilers in a central location, like uh, opt Intel one API. But you can install the full one API stack, as I mentioned, directly in the spac hierarchy. So if you said spac install, uh, Intel dash one API dash compilers, then it will just install it uh, locally. And then you can just use it directly from there by the SPAC load commands and so on. So both options are available, wherever you, whatever you prefer. And if you choose to start with our base uh, Docker container image, which has everything, then you will have access to not just one API, but also CUDA 11.3 or the AMD Rockam pre-installed. So we have support for all three GPU architectures. If you want to also support GPUs or you could just use the Intel compilers and use it on the CPU side mm -hmm. uh, as, as you wish. Does that help answer your question? Yes, yes, that's very helpful. Um, and how often are these things updated? Because it seems like GCC is coming out with updates all the time. So how often, like how often do you get new compilers into the base containers? So uh, we try to stay on a quarterly release for okay. E4S and uh, typically at the time of uh, in November, especially at Supercomputing Conference, we have a major release of all our tools. So that's a good time to sync up too. Okay. But we would like to hear from you if you would like support for creating custom containers with a, a specific version of a compiler or runtime. And we'd be able to help you do that. We can create a recipe, we can create a container, push it on Docker Hub, have you downloaded, give us some feedback of how the base container images work. If you want it to be slimmed down and uh, you know reduced in size and optimized, we'll, we'll help you do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that, that would be really helpful. Um, Cause right now we're experimenting with different ways of building software stacks. And I've been trying to push back, but I've been getting some pushback on it and um, I don't know. I, I think that's probably the best way other than, you know, building it just straight from sources and stuff like that. So this would be very helpful uh, to have some slimmed down containers, uh, especially I think <clears throat> I work in uh, at NOAA. So we're doing weather and climate research and um, it would be very helpful, I think, to the entire community to have containers that just have the packages that are common for the entire community like netcdf and netcdf fortran and uh hdf5 and mpitch and you and know, all uh, of those are included in our main container that you right. use so right. if you wanted to start with something that is full featured you can start with that if you wanted just the runner ones where you just have the base images those are also op available so there's a variety of options for each of the runtimes whether it is uh, targeting a specific operating system like Ubuntu 18.04 or Ubuntu 20 or UBI. I, sh I should mention that if you use a container that comes from, uh, uh, from E4S with a UBI package, 
then the universal binary interface uh, the ubi is a subset of the red hat enterprise linux and what is very interesting about their support model is that they say that if you have a container built from ubi and you deploy it on a red hat enterprise linux system where you have a licensed red hat installation then the ubi container and all its contents are also sort of covered by the red hat support license so the container the the red hat support extends to the container if it is a ubi based container ah oh, interesting so that's just a new way <clears throat> is there any support for for cray so uh, the question was uh, is there any support from cray or for yeah. cray for cray yeah. Yeah, for like a cray for a crisis, because I mean, yeah, for cray. Uh, so you can deploy uh, these containers on a cray system with a shifter as well as singularity. <clears throat> I know cray prefers shifter, and with shifter you can pull a Docker image very easily and launch the the containers. Now, if you have a Ubuntu container. Uh, with e4s and it's running on a cray system it should run well and you should be able to access all the resources properly now if you run into an issue i would say that the best uh, support option for you would be to contact the e4s team because we have built the container and we can help debug that if you try to contact uh, cray and open a ticket it might just take longer for them to debug it and i have no doubt that they should be able to help with that as well but uh, if it's a problem with the container then i think we may be able to provide that support a little better uh, because we have built it mike do you have some yeah no i i agree and and i would also say that um uh you know we have a, a partnership with hpe cray um, as part of the exascale project because, because they're you know they're providing a lot of the of the hardware and software uh, for the Exascale system, so we meet regularly with them, you know, with the senior leadership uh, from HPE Cray. And so, if there are structural things, if there are business elements that you think need to be addressed, um, we have an opportunity to talk with them about that and and see if there are ways to improve the situation. If it's non-technical, you know, we we can look for ways to address situations. And it, and it helps to have additional voices, you know, for that too. You know, if it's not just us asking. Yeah, there was um, there was a command yesterday. I do not remember the command that it was, but um, it it was like e four s c i something. It, CL. 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 Yeah, yes. Yeah, container, container launch, launch yeah. tool. Yes, yes, that's to bind the uh, the MPI yeah. from the system, right? Yep. Yes. So that that so I guess the the crux of my question is that will work on a cray with like a cray version of MPI. Yes, it will because the cray version of MPI is built on the mpitch right. base. So it's a cray mpitch. Right. And uh, even if you have mpitch or mpitch, they are primarily targeting the same MPI ABI, the mpitch ABI, which will right. allow for the substitution. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. I think I've run through my gambit of questions now. <laughs> oh, no problem. Please. <laughs> and I, I wanted to follow up and just say that, you know, um, under the National Strategic Computing Initiative, uh, which um, ECP is part of, and, and now I, I know things are changing. There's this uh, face um, Future of future advanced computing ecosystem. I think I can't remember exactly how it expands, but the NSCI, you know, part of that umbrella is, and part of our mission for ECP is to, you know, work with other U.S. agencies. And so I think, you know, our, you know, there I, we would welcome the opportunity to understand your needs at NOAA, right? You, Thomas, you're at NOAA, right? You said. You yeah, work, I work. Yeah. I work. Uh, yeah, I work in uh, yeah. NOAA. Yeah, 
and you know, and so we would welcome the opportunity to understand and, and try to characterize your needs in in this space. Uh, we we do think, at least on the surface, it seems like you know what what we're doing with E4S could be really valuable uh, to your application teams and and making it much easier for them to you know work with a software stack and work portably and and uh, get good performance and also have this conduit to the new capabilities that we're providing under ECP, especially as your codes you know, move to accelerators if they're still on just CPUs, or if they want to move from you know, Intel and AMD accelerators if they're already running on uh, NVIDIA uh, GPUs. Yeah, we're mostly, mostly running on CPUs. Um, yeah, well, the whole like software stack, yeah. the, I'm oh, sorry, I was oh, just yeah. going to say the whole software stack is available on CPUs. In fact, you can argue that it's much more stable and, and full-featured and robust there just because we've had decades of, you know, developing our right. software there. And we're, you know, we're now transitioning to support the Intel and AMD and have quite a bit of features on NVIDIA, but, you know, still the CPU side is very stable and solid. Right. Uh, and I mean, there is interest in, in GPUs and using GPUs for various things, <clears throat> machine learning and stuff like that. So yeah, there is interest yeah. in it and it is a active area of research in NOAA. I know that yeah. um, I'm not personally involved in it, but it is something yeah. that is, you know, uh, yeah. very involved. So. Well, and as we move some of our, you know, so we're moving all of our say solver stack Right um, and uh, to to the you know all these three GPU targets and you may find that you could just you know start utilizing a small part of of the GPU you know, your execution uh, move some of that over to the you know a GPU platform if a GPU were available and some of those kinds of uh, transitional approaches could be beneficial too. Hey Mike, David Lesmus here. Just hi, to, David. Kind of, hey, hi, good nice to see to hear you. your voice. Kind yeah. of the shadows. I move. I'm at the beach with my family, so uh, high priority oh. to join you guys for a little bit. But just to say, um, to follow on Thomas, so I, if everybody else, I'm I was at DOE. Now I'm at the Department of Interior at the U.S. Geological Survey, and and we're you know early on into the getting into HPC, where we traditionally you know serve. Oh large numbers, tens of thousands of stakeholders yeah. with different applications. But in the very spirit of the ideas project that you and Lewis, you know, led yeah. there, yeah. We're trying to build ecosystems that have all those app attributes of modularity and operability, extensibility yeah. and portability yeah. to HPC. So anyway, just yeah. to say thank you so much for, yeah. you know, inviting us and organizing this. And in that idea that Thomas said is that, you know, through the agencies, you know, like kind of like a belly button to a wider collection yeah. of people that yes. could use these right. capabilities. And we yeah. all have, yeah. you know, like within that climate environment and, you know, hydrology applications, NOAA themselves, you know, have yeah. the national water model all the way up to atmospheric work and yeah. oceanography work. So this, these ideas that you guys have been working on are really, you know, germane yeah. and coming to the point now. And um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, to everybody, I have to, you know, thank David uh, Lesmus for, I mean, he was one of the a small group of people who was willing to take a risk on this new way of thinking about scientific software back, uh, what, seven, eight years ago um, or so, you know, uh, when he was at DOE in the uh, BER, Biological Environmental Research Office, and, um, and that was really the start of it. Uh, so, you know, thank you very much, David, uh, we greatly appreciate your willingness to take a risk and the foresight that you brought to us. And now we hope to pay you back. Thank you. Yeah, look <laughs> yeah. forward to that. And yeah, yeah. some of my call, Jeremy Newsom's on and some other people yeah. have been tuned in, but, and I guess these are being recorded. So like, especially your introductory yeah. presentation that yep. could be available so that we yep. could share it more broadly. Okay, yep. cool. Thank exactly, you. yeah. Thanks, yeah. Mike. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you, David. Hope you enjoy your time at the beach. All right, any other comments or questions from anybody? So, Mike, something that's come up a, a few times among our members is, you know, the XSDK has, has lots of capabilities and yeah. lots of mm -hmm. libraries. Yeah. Do, do you have advice for someone how they, you know, work, 
decide what to use out of it, how they try it out or how, how they experiment with it? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, a few few comments. So, so we do tutorials um, of all of of almost all. Not everybody participates, but a big chunk of of the libraries teams have participated. The XSDK. So this is the math library. So there, you know, I think more than twenty now libraries that can be built with the XSDK, uh, you know, SPAC install script. Um, so you can do SPAC install XSTK and get, you know, all these libraries installed. I, I don't necessarily suggest that you try to install all of them. I mean, if you if you get them in a container and they're all there, that's great. Um, but um, mostly, I think in a lot of instances, users um, are interested in a specific, say, subset of the math libraries. And so, but, but because we build the whole thing, you have the ability to more easily build, you know, a subtree of it. I think that's the key value proposition, at least for an individual user, is that, of course, then if you're buying in and using E4S as a whole ecosystem or the XSDK as a whole ecosystem, either from source or, or in a container environment, you get it all. And so that's just fine. But, the, uh, but that, that's in terms of how to build and install. But in terms of usage, you know, the, if you look, go to the xsdk.info uh, website, uh, you'll find uh, pointers to um, the tutorials that have been done in the past. Um, many of those are recorded, and so you can, uh, you know, watch them and and see uh, the content. If you want specific guidance on you know, say what short list of libraries to consider for solving a particular problem, you can certainly send email to me. This is my area, you know, my original area of domain expertise. I would have some advice for you. Uh, and I can also share, you know, uh, uh, that, you know, your question with others, colleagues of mine, and we can help guide you. Um, we, we often get this question is that we're still starting, we're still trying to figure out how best to answer these kinds of questions, you know, the 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 salt that say the you know the li scientific library software ecosystem is in fact somewhat complementary. There is overlap in functionality across the various libraries, but each team that is part of this has carved out a kind of a portion of the whole solver ecosystem space where they're 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 the best idea or the best option for a, a variety of design choices. Um, and, and so there often is something you know that's probably a better choice than than another, depending on some very deep, subtle details of your particular situation, including things like you know how how much C you know does your development staff know or you know are, are they familiar with and right versus say Fortran and and so those kinds of things are you know very subtle details that are hard to put out there in a kind in a kind of direct you know, just prescriptive way of how you could pick things, but we're always very uh, willing to answer questions and give guidance based on your particular situation. It, it's a terrible answer. I hate giving that answer. No, no, I, I think uh, it's actually um, a good answer that you're willing to help provide some guidance because I think, you know, people look at it and maybe <clears throat> overwhelmed. <clears throat> It, it and is. And if you can I, help I narrow totally it down, that. then that you know that that helps a lot. I think. So. Yeah, I, I I get that, and I you know I've been in like I said I've been in this domain for decades, and and I really hate that I have to give that answer. But at the same time, it, it's hard to give a better or different answer. You know, right right now, I don't know. You know, we keep trying to think about how to be more prescriptive, but it's it's really hard. Yep. Hey, Mike, this yeah. is Susie. Um, there are folks on the participants list here that uh, I was wondering if maybe I could ask their their feedback. And one was uh, Rogeria Rodriguez from Whirlpool. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. And also Gert Rebel from Goodyear. And I was wondering if, if you all would like to give some observations about what you heard or whether it's hitting a sweet spot in your companies, where you, you know, how you're thinking about this. Sorry to put you on the spot. If you don't want to just say you, <laughs> you don't, you don't no, have no, to say anything. No, you don't no, have to. no, no problem. Uh, actually, we, we are learning a lot uh, the, these uh, two days because this is something new for us. We are not uh, exploring these uh, facilities uh, today. So main objective here is to learn uh, what is available, what type of tools 
uh, software we, we have and how we can connect our needs to these, uh, these facilities. Thank you. Well, super. Whatever we can do to help, reach out to me and David or Samir or Mike. If you don't have emails, just contact one of us and we'll, we'll get you plugged in wherever you need to be. Yeah. Hey, Gerd, I see you there. Yes, okay. I, I was trying to talk and I uh, realized I was still on mute, so I unmuted myself. Uh, again, thanks a lot for, for uh, organizing this. It has been very insightful so far. And I actually have a, a, a question. Um, as, you, as you know, Gutier is using um, a proprietary version of uh, uh, basically share applications, yep. um, primarily Adagio and Presto. And I was wondering, so, so far what we do is we receive the source code from Sandia and we compile ourselves. So I was thinking if instead this um, proprietary piece of software we use comes to us in the form of a container, yeah. would that make life for our system administrators much easier? That would be yeah. my first question. And the second question yeah. would be, would there any be any performance um, issue with running our our codes in a production uh, fashion um, from a container? Yeah. Um, I well, I, I can. My, my question. <clears throat> is yeah, I, I can. I can start off. Um, so, so with so I'm at Sandia. Um, I don't work directly with the with the Sierra team lately. I have in the past. I worked a lot with them because uh, Trilinos, the the scientific libraries effort that I that I've led for years, um, you know, underpins a lot of the functionality in in the Sierra suites. Um, uh, I, and at Sandia, you know, we're, we are like many people uh, under trying to understand and characterize, you know, how container based workflows fit. Uh, within our you know production ecosystems, uh, and, and so you know we're you know we're we're learning and and deploying you know E4S is certainly recognized at Sandia as a software stack that um, can be that's available, and we're looking at ways to how to how we can integrate it or leverage the investment in E4S uh, within the application suites at Sandia. Sandia. So we're there, we're already started. In the direction I think that you're that you're you're perhaps interested in, um, I can't speak to the Sierra team's you know willingness at this point to try to consider uh, you know a container-based approach, but I can certainly follow up. You you said you are particular Adagio and Presto. Is that what you said? No, well, we have. I mean, the the we have a, a collection of, of yeah. a subset of what is in Sierra that yeah, we use. Sure. So sure. Adagio and Presto are. Part of mean? it, Aria is part of it, so it's okay. a whole collection of things. Okay, yeah, I, I'd be happy to follow up with the Sierra team. Um, you know, Mike Glass in particular. Mm -hmm. you and of course, this is this is uh, uh, we have pro proprietary pieces in there, right? So this is yes, understood. Be... You, yeah, and you'd like to be able to take what the Sandia provides in a container and then uh, augment what they provide to you and build on top of that. I assume, is that right? Or even because what really runs on our <clears throat> cluster, our mm -hmm. end users, is basically the very same source code that is available at Sandia. So right. when we have right. a container that contains yeah. exactly that yep. in the form of one of the releases, yep. we could use that potentially. Yeah, exactly right. right. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very powerful workflow, yeah. So I, I don't, I, I imagine that that would be making things easier for our system yep. administrators. Yep. The only one at Goodshare who really needs to compile the code is myself because yep. I'm okay. doing development in it. So that's a little bit different, but there has yep. been a discussion. Maybe I could start working on one of the Sandia systems doing that so that the source code doesn't even need to be installed on the Gutier site. So yeah. if we yeah. were just you running from containers, right? Yeah. yeah. That could be. So basically, our code is not any different from what Sandia at some point provides as the version of the day becoming a release. Yeah. And that so that I think you can yeah. create a container for that, right? Yeah. You know, and to address your point of performance, our already, experience. Oh, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. We you already up. said like there are ways to, I, I heard Samir talk about yeah. um, 
substituting your own Intel MPI for whatever is supplied in the in the container. Yeah. Yes. So that's the something that can be done. So yeah. that's yeah. yeah. Right. I, I, yeah, I should also uh, go ahead. Add go, that, ahead uh, go ahead, Go ahead. Uh, that we have a uh, we have a study here. I've just posted a link in the chat window that okay. was conducted at Sandia by Andrew yeah. Young, yeah. and he looked at the issues of uh, running natively versus running with a container and yeah. the overheads that you can see. And in some cases, they have found that, especially if your application uses uh, uh, Python based workflow, where a large number of nodes would suddenly come up and make calls to a set of shared objects that must be loaded from the file system. They have found that the luster performance can be a big bottleneck because the metadata servers uh, assign the servers based on the directory. And if everyone is reading from the same directory, all the requests go to the same metadata server and the performance can be very bad on native execution. But within a container, all those requests get serviced locally from the RAM disk. And mm -hmm. so you avoid the overhead of loading a large number of shared objects from a file server like from okay. Luster. And so you actually get much faster startup times. There are other projects like the Spindle project at Livermore that has uh, explicitly copied the shared objects into a RAM disk and that gets equivalent similar performance gain because you do not need to just go to the metadata server to resolve all the startup issues. And you can get, in fact, much faster uh, startup times with containers, that's especially for Python based to workloads. That's of course, assuming that the startup time would be an issue, right? If things run for nine right. days, it's less of an issue. Yes. Yeah, yeah sure. But, but even in general, um, are we our experience with containers, and we've had many years now of experience with containers, is that there, you have no real performance degradation. Okay versus a, a native installation. In fact, you, you know, because you can, you can, in the container environment, you can have the compiler flags tweaked, you know, by an expert who then provides you the container versus you having to figure out what compiler flags would be the right ones for a particular product. You, you know, you often will have a more positive experience uh, with the container based environments. Um, you know, on everything, I, you know, I, I've done container work on my laptop with a, you know, an install of, of Trilino. So we used to do our wet, our uh, Trilino's tutorials and we still do with container based approaches. I can down, I can install Docker, I can download the Trilino's container and run and get, you know, MPI uh, scalability on, on the cores of my laptop. And it's just way cool. And I haven't installed anything other than Docker and the container. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. So, yeah. So we, we've had really good experience. The that's another thing you, if your local machine doesn't have a Linux system, it's just as a Windows system, right? But you get a yeah. container that can run exactly. like Docker or Singularity uh, yep. and you can yeah. still run it. Yeah, and, and you can develop in it and you know do all sorts yeah. of cool things, yeah, yeah. Sometimes also another thing that I might see as an advantage here is sometimes you want to reach back to an older version of your code Yep. Yes. And sometimes the shared libraries go away or the OS yep. is updated. You can't run an older version anymore, but yep. if it was exactly. in a container, yep. it will let you run it, right? Yeah, it's also a way of providing new capabilities on, you know, you know, you, you know, you maybe your your system admins deploy, you know, rel version, whatever, and and it only has old compilers and they're reluctant to do any kind of updates, but you can inject a container into that environment. You know, with the latest compilers and and get people your user base moving forward, even though their you know base system hasn't moved forward. So there are a lot of advantages forward and backward in time uh, that you can take advantage of. Okay, thank you. So everyone, we we've got Hi. about two minutes left. Maybe time for one more question. We don't want to cut into Samir's time for the tutorial. Hey, Susie, I had a quick question. I heard sure, for the container with Linux to be able to run on the, a Windows machine, um, is the converse also available running um, a Windows container 
there is such a thing on a Linux machine? Uh, with containers, we just have Linux as the base for the containers. Thank you. We don't have uh, Windows. That's not to say that you cannot run virtual box or some virtualization system with, uh, uh, with a Windows VM on a Linux machine, but uh, with containers, we primarily are targeting Linux. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, there's not complete symmetry in this ecosystem. <laughs> Hi, this is uh, Craig Bosma with Boeing. So one quick question uh, on the topic of Windows support. I was wondering if there's, and I know this is probably a long shot, whether there's any thought of ever having uh, SPAC support uh, yeah. Windows as a development environment. Yeah. Uh, I know for our use cases, often our software needs to be deployed both in a Linux cluster environment and built and deployed for yeah. engineers who might be running Windows-based yeah. tooling. Right, uh, yeah, there's, so actually, there's actually more than a thought. Um, there, there, are, there are planned efforts over the coming year to provide uh, SPAC uh, on, on Windows. So we, we are moving on that. Um, it, it, you know, it, it, it's a little bit of a kind of a surprise thing. You know, we, we're, we're socializing ECP funding you know, to, to, to help accelerate the effort, but it, it's ongoing, you know, and, and, you know, people might wonder why ECP funding should be used to support uh, porting to Windows. Uh, it does sound a little bit strange, but I think it makes business sense. Um, and, and so, yes, the, that effort is moving forward. Now, you know, moving the rest of the things that SPAC builds uh, to Windows, you know, there, there are some things that are already available on Windows um, that, that can be built. If you know, a SPAC were available on Windows, we could build, you know, a collection of our solver libraries, for example. Not all tools are, are well suited to be ported to Windows yet. So that effort will take more time. Sure, that, that makes sense. And that's, uh, that's great news, thanks. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we're very excited about that opportunity actually. It, it, you know, we moved to CMake, you know, on a number of projects that I lead it, it for no other reason, at least the primary reason was because you could run it on Windows. And, and that uh, was a, that was the selling thing. There are other good things about CMake, don't get me wrong, it, that's a good tool, but that was the kind of the killer app aspect of it. Oh, good. This is a great discussion. I think at the end, we're going to have a little more time for discussion. I, don't, I think Samir will be there. I don't know, Mike, if you're planning yeah, to- it's on my, Yeah, it's on my calendar. I've blocked off the time. Nobody's uh, challenged uh, that time slot. So I'm going to, I plan to be here. Th that is awesome. So <laughs> yeah. yes, I hope we can continue this discussion. And if you have more questions after our demos today, let us uh, discuss this. We would also like to hear back from you on what worked, what doesn't work well for you in the hands-on sessions. And uh, if you have any guidance for us for future uh, industry council uh, and agencies yeah. uh, workshops, yeah. what we could target. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. And we have our next speaker, David Rogers from Los Alamos National Laboratory. And he's here to show us the Pantheon demo uh, so I would request you to all uh, uh, log into your instances. We have kept your instances. Everything is uh, just as it was yesterday. And if there is any issue, please uh, reserve another instance at uh, uh, going to our web page. And uh, you can see that uh, I'm just putting in the link to the tutorial in case you need to check the password or which instance you were on. And you can grab that instance and start it up. And uh, uh, I would like to welcome David, who's here to present. Uh, ask me if you can switch the screen share. Yeah, he, he's a co-host now, David. OK, so I just, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you, okay. David. So I just share, what? is that what, we, what I do? Yes, please share. OK, okay so. Hi everybody. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about Pantheon today. Um, I'm going to go through a few slides to give you an idea of what this thing is, 
And then uh, we have some, uh, we have a demo on the instance, um, which I'll go through. And, um, you know, that we'll go through that a little bit quickly, but, you know, I encourage you to uh, dig in and just kind of take a look around after, after I describe kind of the overall structure of what Pantheon is. Um, so, so we're going to do those in two parts. I'll start with a few slides here and hopefully this all works. Um, we'll <laughs> let's see here. Okay. All right. Um, does that work? You guys see that? Yeah, but you are not in a slide mode. Oh, good. Yes. There we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me give this a shot. All right. So um, let's see here. I want to uh, just want to check the time here just to make sure I don't go too, too long. Um, okay. So, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about Pantheon and Pantheon is, you know, an example of kind of all these things that you guys are talking about coming together and in, into kind of a practical um, thing, um, you know, re in particular reproducible workflows. So, um, okay, hold on, which way? Not, uh, let's see. Okay, whoops, let me, sorry. That was driver error there. Okay, so we're going to talk about what the Pantheon project is, and you know, the motivating case for some of the work we're doing. Just right up front, at one takeaway is, you know, if you take nothing else from this, I want to, want you to remember that Pantheon is a library of reproducible end-to-end -end scientific workflows, and we're really designing these for anyone to explore and build on. So even if you're not an expert in a code, you know, if you look at the Pantheon web, web page and there's a code there that you could run, um, you don't have to be an expert. You can go dig in and take a look at it and, and really learn something about how that particular code works and then learn something about that particular end-to-end -end workflow. Okay, so it's really designed to be kind of hands-on and this library of examples, okay? Um, we have a bunch of examples and I'll show you some of those. And in fact, we're gonna go through one on the, on the VM. And then I wanna to talk to you briefly about the discussions that the, the Xscale project and in particular E4S has had on this project and our ability to, to, to really put something else that people can, people can use. So uh, this slide deck is available. There's a bunch of people that underlie all of this work. Um, and you know, in particular, the E4S team, um, we've been working for the, with this team for about a year now. Um, it's been a terrific experience. Um, the SPAC team has been great in, in also providing a lot of capabilities. Um, so this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so um, thanks to everybody who contributes to this. Um, and again, at a high, high level, um, Pantheon and E4S are working together to support these end-to-end -end workflow examples. Uh, there's this kind of highlight slide we did last year about the speed up that we experienced. I'll, I'll talk more about that in, in a little bit later. Um, okay, so you know what we're doing in this kind of um, in this at the exascale is integrating this really complex set of technologies. Everybody's aware of that, especially on this call. You know how difficult uh, this this all is. Um, so we have these individual pieces, but a broadband impact of, of this effort is how the pieces come together in workflows, right? So it's an additional level, level of complexity to say, you know, how do we get a code with some in situ um, uh, analysis and then some post-processing, you know, how do you even begin to pull all that together? Um, and, and that can be daunting, um, but we're trying to get examples together by you know, working across these different products to kind of, to, to make these examples in Pantheon. So, you know, we have this really vibrant culture and coding right now about, about, you know, repositories and continuous integrations. There's all of these great mechanisms in place to work on individual processes. So the question that Pantheon is kind of is posing is, can we create a similar communication cult culture around workflow development? So around these places where these things come together, um, and even though it's a complex process, you know, it just kind of culture that we have around individual projects, um, and you know we're we're getting started. So, um, so I, I think that this this community understands that there is um, you know examples are broadly useful um, across the both the, the development and the science community. Um, you know 
often we say we've had a lot of, of instances of maybe we have a summer student come to work on a project and they want to work on a code and boy the first thing you have to do is get them building the code and figuring out how to get the thing to work and you know that can be just a huge daunting task uh, so we're trying to make that kind of available um, when we do these workflows we also kind of you know, projects bang up together into in, in interesting ways. We find problems that we wouldn't do if we weren't kind of testing them at this kind of uh, high level. Um, there are examples of that that I'll, I'll talk about. And then also, um, you know, we think of these examples to, to, that can help people at the science level too. So if you're not a computer science expert, but you're a scientist and, and you want to get started with something, um, you know, these, these workflows can serve as, as learning tools as, uh, as well. Um, and the idea is that, you know, if we can capture these things and, and make, you know, really capture what scientists are doing, that helps both the scientists with the examples. It also helps the data, data science community because they have real examples they can use. They can run their machine learning against real, real data. And that just helps everybody if we have a vibrant culture of these, um, of these examples. So um, the project vision um, is... You know, we want to be this home for reproducible workflows for scientific computing. Uh, we have a web page. Um, uh, it's not on. Oh, it is here. PantheonScience.org, which I welcome you to, you know, dig around in while, while I'm talking. Um, we have this notion um, of a project. So a project is a kind of a, is a collection of, of workflows for a certain, um, uh, for a certain uh, scope and goal. So you can have a project that, you know, for right now, we're working in the ECP space, but you could have a project for some industry goal or a project for an education goal. And those things, you know, can be defined at the project level. So you can have a, a, a different set of requirements that you're trying to fill than somebody else. Um, the, you know, the idea of a workflow, I think is pretty well understood. It's just a reproducible set of operations. And we base this on a template. Um, we specifically define these in Pantheon uh, by a URL for a Git repo. Um, we'll go into that a little bit. And then a template is, you know, just an idea of if you have a project, you have something you're trying to do that's generalized. And that's really, uh, that generalized description is what we call a template. Okay. Um, the goal for what we're doing is, is, is not to have, you know, wow, it sounds kind of neat. I'd like to get a Pantheon project up, but boy, it sounds like a lot of work. Um, the idea is you can define exactly kind of what what your project is and what your scope of work is, what you're trying to do, so that there's not one standard that everybody has to 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 get to, you know, which would make a barrier at entry. So the idea is that it's simple as possible to put these examples out and get people interested in them. Okay. Um, so Pantheon, um, what does the word mean? <laughs> Why do we call it Pantheon? So um, if you look up, you know, the the definition of Pantheon, um, you know, you'll see the Pantheon in Rome, which is the uh, uh, we're trying to uh, here is that you know a pantheon is this kind of group of of important things right so what we're trying to do is make a pantheon of these examples um just you know this, this highly tested reproducible set of examples so that's why we, we call the project pantheon um so i call this a practical approach to reproducible workflow why why do i use that word um so we're limited in scope. Um, this kind of an idea of a workflow could be just super complicated if you try to run on every architecture and in every instance and everything. What we're trying to do is, is a limited scope approach. So in particular, um, our workflows work on Summit. Um, and you know, that's, that's our target. Uh, these things can be generalized because they're, you know, when you break these things apart, there's, there's a few things that you need to work that would be cross platforms. Um, so again, we believe that the example, a working example is useful because someone could take it to another platform uh, if they'd like. And obviously we're looking at the, the you know, exascale platforms that are coming down, um, you know, that are in the near future. And, and hopefully, you know, our, our intention is that we can take these to these new platforms very quickly. And there's, there's not really a whole lot of work to be done uh, to do that. Um, you know, they're reproducible. So you should be able to take this and run it and get the same result we do. Um, and then we're trying to do these things for concrete hands-on examples, um, trying to, you know, we've been working with customers to say, what's an example of something that you do? 
uh, working with code teams, what's an example of something that you do? Um, and the idea is these are quick to get started. Um, they can be scaled up. In fact, that's one of the things that we're working on now. Um, okay, we define a set of states. So, um, you know, if you want, you, you can advertise, you know, when you make one of these things, you say, hey, this is a release uh, workflow. And what does that mean? You know, that means that the team behind that is putting in work to guarantee that it works in a production setting as whatever that is defined by. So, you know, these things should work. And, and the team is making a, you know, is putting in the continuous integration and the development time to make sure that that happens. Um, and this is the most recent stuff we've done is in this state. We've actually, you know, put things out that we believe, you know, should work end to end. And, and in fact, we just caught a, a bug because we went through our uh, testing process again to make sure everything worked. Um, you know, you can call something development. The idea behind a development workflow is um, you know, right? You're you're working on it. You expect it to go to release, but yeah, it might not. It might not work in all cases, and you're still working on it. And then the last thing is kind of a catch-all. If you've got something, you just want to put it out and want people to be able to see it. it might not work in all situations, but you think that the the workflow is captured is useful to the community. You can put it out in a research, and then you know it's really just kind of a buyer beware kind of thing. Um, so the idea with this is that you can determine, again, the level of effort that you'd like to invest in making a workflow. Um, so if you want to take a look at these, they're available through pantheonscience.org. Um, there's, you know, follow the links in there. And, and as you dig into the repositories, you should have, you know, an overall idea about what a project is. And then individual projects have, have more detail in them. Um, the way to think of this is, you know, the Pantheon project page is recording these, you know, published workflows that people say, hey, I'm, I'm giving you this workflow and it's in this state. Um, so if you look on the website, you'll see that there are, um, you know, this, this list of available workflows and there's specific commits that are recorded um, into these um, other repositories. Okay, so we're kind of the publishing place for these things. Um, and then each of those individual things has its own documentation. But, you know, this is kind of a way of thinking of when, when we submit one of these things, we go through a testing process and we say, okay, it works. It does what the, the submitter says. And, um, you know, we're, we're, it, 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 it does what they say. You know, we're kind of the stamp of approval, okay? Um, so let's talk about a basic workflow. This is, you know, one shape, but this is the kind that you're going to see today in the examples. So there's some setup. Um, which is, hey, I need this software of this version to run. So I'm going to check, is, is it installed? Or um, in our case, we just kind of go ahead and, and install it for you. So these are tied to specific commits of specific software. Um, and E4S and, and SPAC are invaluable, obviously, in that set, in that step. Um, we have, you know, a set of managed files that we then use to run. Um, this produces data. Um, you can do post-processing. These are optional steps, but, you know, and typically we are doing a post-processing step to either create a, a final format or maybe even do some more processing. And then typically we validate the results as well to make sure it actually did what we thought it would do. Okay, so that's, you know, this is industry standard kind of stuff. Um, so how do you run these things? Um, for the picture that we have right now, um, got to be on Summit, and um, you clone the repository. You go in and you look at the at the the, the um, Pantheon uh, list, and you say, "I'd like you know this particular one that I want." So you clone this repository, and it's at a specific commit. Um, there could be multiple branches, but you know you, you the information on the publishing page is what you're going to use. Um, you define a few variables because you need to say you know where where the, the these are variables, excuse, sorry, um, you know, because you want to tell the scripts where to put things and things like that. And then you just run the execute script, okay? And after you run the execute script, it starts to chug away and, and we'll see this today in the example. Um, so these are meant to be self-documenting. The way that we've kind of broken things up is into these logical steps, those four steps that I talked about. And the idea behind you know, the kind of philosophy of what we're doing is um, there shouldn't be a lot hidden in these steps. We've in fact removed, um, we started off by using a, a, a workflow management toolkit and it introduced a layer of complexity that we decided wasn't really necessary. And so the idea is if you're, 
if you're the kind of person that wants to, to look at these things, you know, we expect that you're going to be able to dig into these scripts with an editor and kind of take a look at them. But the scripts themselves should be as simple as possible. So you should be able to start with the execute script and then kind of logically look at this examples or look at the steps and just kind of dig in. Um, there shouldn't be anything hidden. Okay. Um, and that's what I mean by follow the breadcrumbs. You, if you take a look at these things, you should be able to kind of look through and, oh, that's what they're doing. And, oh, I see they copied this file and they had to change this variable. It should all be well documented in the, in the scripts. Um, and they're meant to be something that, you know, you can go in and, 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 and fool around with, change things, try things. And it might not work, but you can always go back and, you know, uh, clone the repository again and start from a fresh slate. So if you make a change and it breaks something, you know, that's an opportunity to learn. It's also, oops, I didn't want to do that. I'm going to go start over again. Um, okay, so so the project that we've got right now is is um, with E4S specifically and, and with uh, the cinema project. You know, trying to do is across this complex set of things that come out of the Exascale project. I'm not going to go too much into detail here just for time's sake, but you know, we're integrating a whole bunch of these things across the um, between from apps to post-processing. Um, in particular, the things that we're producing are collections of images. So we run a simulation and we do a visualization and capture a bunch of images. Um, there are a lot of reasons to do that. I don't want to go into detail about cinema, but um, you know, if you have this rich set of, of images after you run the simulation, there's a lot of things you can do with it, including both explore the data sets and also, um, you know, explore the images. You can look more about cinema uh, at that location. That location. Um, so uh, this particular project is a set of workflows that create cinema databases. So they're going to run a simulation and somehow create a set of uh, images from that. Um, we have a number of these under development. And a number of them are in release. In fact, uh, this list needs to be updated because we've we've actually put out another one since the, I last uh, used these slides. Um, the complexity here can be kind of overwhelming because you have a workflow application that you can use. So you can use whatever science code you're looking at. Um, you know, does it have a SPAC build? Does it not have a SPAC build? Does it include a set, et cetera, et cetera? You know, post processing. This can be this is just can be such a huge cross product. Um, again, what we're trying to do is give specific examples and and believe we believe that those examples are useful. Um, you know, just because they're out there and you can touch them. Um, one of the major considerations, in fact, the only way that we're able to release things I, I, in release mode is because of E4S and working with them. Um, the reason is. Uh, Practically speaking, the build step for these these uh, things can be massive. It can be um, something that makes a workflow kind of unusable. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this, but I just you know one the thing that 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 for us made the difference between whether or not we could release something was can we get an E4S cache of a significant portion of of the uh, application side of this, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we uh, this <laughs> we have two lists. We have the stuff that we're releasing, and then we have the stuff that we're working on in order to release. The unreleased ex uh, list is just kind of exploding because there's lots of little lots of use cases. Kind of prior to of workflows that we think would be useful as examples, uh, because again, there's just so many things that could be done. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about these. Some of the workflows are there. Um, we have an example which um, is uh, which links uh, uh, an example mini app to ascent the uh, in situ infrastructure and produces a cinema database. So this is a kind of low level example that is kind of easy to get up and running on a variety of platforms. Um, so we have that. We have one that runs with uh, Nix. Um, it does data sampling. With uh, and it has it's CUDA enabled, and um, you know this runs and produces a cinema database. Um, interestingly enough, here this is one of those examples of kind of banging the pieces together. We we got a runtime error with the cache, and it was because of the way that you know ascent was was put together, and um, you know everything built and and everything 
appeared to run, but actually in a runtime setting because of the way that the spec was, you know, rejiggering the paths, uh, we actually got a runtime error. This, you know, we communicated this with both the spec and ascent team and, and there was a fix uh, produced. So that was kind of cool. Um, and there are examples of these things uh, throughout what we've done. Um, tiny things that we hit that pe people just don't detect because the complexity of the interaction of all these pieces is so, uh, so uh, huge. Um, but this is kind of one of the things that we're able to offer to the community is, is we're able to find these things that, that maybe other people wouldn't. Um, and then the one we're going to talk about today is a exowin nalowin regression test to a cinema database. I'll go into more detail, but um, you know that's that's one of the examples we have. Um, I, I just wanted to take a minute to talk about um, why we have a project at all um, that that you know we think is useful to the community. And really, this is because of the underlying technologies that are being built, like. E4S and, and, and SPAC, um, you know, I showed this before about, we have a setup step, a run step, a post-process and validate step. Um, you know, I kind of made this graph to, to communicate this to everybody. This is just a diagram, but basically, you know, if you have a workflow, the ideal contribution would be, um, we don't have to do much setup work. Um, we capture a lot of science by pulling these pieces together and making them work together. Um, you know, we have post-processing technology that where we can um, do different things with the results and have different examples. So we'd really like our contribution as a project to be in this kind of run post-processing phase. Um, but when we started this project, a year, I would say, and a half ago, um, you know, we had these super complicated build scripts where we went out and we you know, found what commits worked and how did these things work. We read the documentation for these different, um, these different science codes. And so really what ended up happening was just that background work, getting a script that run that ran and, and built everything and put it together um, was actually one of the contributions. And then everything else sort of kind of paled in comparison to that. Um, and that was also coincidentally, or of course, the sp space or the thing that took the most time in terms of compute was getting things to compile and and, and set up um, with the you know spac and e4s and all the things that have been done underneath um, uh, this stuff it we're really approaching this idea where um, you know working with e4s we can get a uh, we can get a, a specification through spac of some application and other dependent things that we need. And you know, all we do is we we go we go through the thing of what what those specific versions have to be. You know, we test it, and then we ask the E4S uh, team to make a cache of those things. And so setup becomes almost nothing. Um, you know, in 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 terms of a user's experience. So if you run one of these things um, on in on the target architecture, um, the the uh, cached binaries get pulled and setup really becomes, you know, just a matter of minutes uh, where it could have been, you know, when we started, it was, it was a huge amount of time because the builds would break. They were very fragile. Um, and now this is just incredibly useful. So really what we as a project can concentrate on is, um, you know, what's the actual thing that we're running and what's the actual thing that, that we're post-processing. So, um, you know, it's just been fantastic to work with, with, uh, with the E4S team and and it's back and all these things that are being created because now we really feel we can make a contribution rather than just kind of you know uh, trying to set things up all the time. So this has been fantastic um, for us. Um, so there's more uh, in the slides um, and in fact I've skipped over some of these for this presentation, uh, but that gives you an overview of of the Pantheon project and kind of what we're going to achieve. So now I'm going to switch over to uh, doing a demo um, of the one particular, um, one of the particular uh, workflows that we've got. So, um, okay. Oops. Oh, of course I've got to log in here. this Ah, there we go. Um, this example is actually really a, a terrific example of all these things working together because um, 
uh, Samir and his team had had built um, this uh, code, uh, Exobin Nalawind. And um, so, you know, when we went to, in the old days, we'd go out and we'd get a code, we'd do all that research and make our own, you know, build scripts and things like that. And, um, you know, this time we literally just said, hey, we're going to be, we're going to be doing and we're going to do an Exowind Nalawind uh, uh, example. And it was already built, it was already cached. And all we did was just run, you know, set, set up our workflow and run it. And so we, as a, as a project, had never actually built um, this code. And that's just a fantastic example of these things working together because it, it made our work on the, on the workflow just so much easier. Um, so that was just a fantastic, I think this is a great example of, of all of these things working together. Um, so if you want to go ahead and, and, and dig into the tutorial here, um, the first thing to do, you can look at the README. Um, there's also uh, this web uh, or these, these web pages that I'll take you through. But um, the first thing to do is just type, uh, type Pantheon in the shell. And that will that will bring up this um, tutorial um, set of web pages, and that's what I'm going to go through right now. Um, so, uh, and these are available. This is actually a repository that can be downloaded as well, in case you'd like that. Um, this is slightly different, um, a slightly different workflow because it's designed to actually work on this VM. Um, so I'm not going to go too much into that, other than to say. Um, you know, we actually have this working on Summit and- Hey, um, David. Yeah. Right now, I still see your slides. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot. Nicely done. Thank you for interrupting. <laughs> no problem. Just... Okay, let's see if I've got the... Now I'm confused. Do, do you see the... Um... What am I sharing right now? We're seeing the desktop, but it's just the PowerPoint and the Google. WebEx window behind it. Okay, Google Chrome you're... here. There we go. How's that? There, yeah, perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so yeah, if you get on the, the VM, um, open up a shell and type uh, Pantheon, you'll have this. Um, let's see if I can. Yeah, you'll get this, uh, this set of web pages, which is what I'm going to take you through. Um, you can either copy the instructions or the commands, uh, the shell commands from the readme file um, that's sitting there too, or you can swipe them from this either way. Um, okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, so we talked about the Pantheon project. We're going to show you a workflow that we actually designed to run on Summit, um, but like I said, we've adapted it to the VM. The overall steps in the shape of the thing is the same. And really we just kind of, it's a difference in how you kind of launch the job basically. Um, okay, and there's some information here about how you actually cut and paste from these. It's a little different in the shells, um, but if you just cut and paste from the readme file, that may be a better way to do it. Um, I talked about um, I talked about the uh, project and Pantheon states and things. Uh, there is a little bit of Pantheon metadata um, which for purposes of this uh, tutorial, I'm not gonna go into too much, but it helps us define and differentiate these workflows from each other. Um, so the tutorial that we're gonna go through is this Exowin Nalawind example. Um, if you look at this, this diagram shows, you know, it's gonna run the simulation. Um, it's gonna dump some files on disk and then run Paraview post-processing to create a cinema database. And then we can look at that with a viewer and, and do some, we also have a validation step. So um, that the interesting thing about this is that it's a post-processing um, workflow. So it involves actually, you know, both running the simulation and then calling up uh, Paraview in a Python script afterwards to do the simulation. Um, this is just one example of the kind of stuff we're doing. There are you know, plenty of in situ examples as well. This one just happens to use Paraview post-processing. Um, so um, this is an, an example of what the, the data will look like. If you wanna take a look at that, I've already um, swiped this um, uh, command here, 
But if you want to take a look at it, um, you can get a cinema or a, uh, a Jupyter notebook up and running on the cinema database that results from this. And um, one of the things that you'll notice is um, because we have this database of images, we can kind of scroll through time pretty quickly, um, which is one of the features of just you know working with images. But um, this is what the ultimate stuff is going to look like that we produce with this workflow. Okay. So yeah, you, you, if you want to, you can take a look at either one of either the Jupyter Notebook implementation, or there's also a um, just a browser-based view of this data as well. Okay. Um, all right. So the um, if you want to take a look at the kind of the files and make this thing up and see if I'm, you know, telling the truth when I say that it. Did the screen just freeze? And we lost audio. Oh. Yes, I think we lost him. <laughs> um, hold on a second. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Sorry. I'm not sure. Okay. All right. Okay, so you should, is my instances up there? Yeah, looks good, yes. Okay, all right. So if you CD to that directory, um, you can see the structure of of the, the uh, repository for David, you are cutting out. Uh, do you want to just uh, turn off the video? Maybe that will help. Yeah, sure, I'll do that. Um... Okay. Look, do you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. okay. All right. So, so this is a just gives you uh, a, a look at what is in here. Um, and really the kind of important things, as I said, are the execute script, which is kind of the where, where you would take a look if you wanted to see what was going to happen when, when you started this thing. We've broken things out into different directories that are named for the step. Um, there is an inputs directory, which is where you keep everything um, that you're going to use to as an input into the, into the workflow. Um, so these things should be fairly logically um, um, named and you can always just go back and look at the execute script to see which script is being run and just go ahead and look at that as well so um again the, the idea is that there's not a huge documentation burden on you if you want to do one of these things this is the structure that we're using if you have a different one that makes sense you know you can certainly use that as well um, but this is a good we've, we've done some work to kind of pull this apart into a way that makes sense um, so the execute script as i said is um, is the thing where you know all the steps get run. So this is where you do the install, et cetera, et cetera. The one thing that you'll see when you look at this is there's this kind of wait for completion step. Um, so if you're running on a supercomputer and you want to kind of run this interactively, you run it, and then when you go to submit the job, you know you have to sit there and wait. So this this does a kind of a nice visual display for that. Um, but that's really the only thing that kind of is is a little odd um, that's not really a step that you that is in that diagram um, we don't it, it's it, it's different here we don't do that because we're not submitting it to the, in the same way but um, anyway you can take a look at, at the, the steps um, these are linked in so you can actually dig in and say okay um, let's see if this comes up so if we dig into the script you can see they all kind of take the same form as, as you would expect a shell script to. There's there's a bunch of uh, variables that are are established up front, and then you have the clauses that would go through and, and build things, or you know, and and again, these should be really 
um, clearly uh, showing what they're doing. So this is this is a clause that's cleaning up the build area so that you know you can just start new and things like that. So you can take a look at each one of those scripts and see what they're doing. Um, the um, so let's take a look at this example. Um, so in order to do this, you want to you want to get to this directory, um, okay? And then you want to just type execute. And it'll start doing this. Um, it's, you know, we've tried to spit out useful information. Some of this stuff is from the Pantheon script. Some of this is from the code as they execute. Um, so, you know, what this is going to do is establish your work area, clean it out, make sure things are installed correctly, and then it's going to run the, the job. Um, so, uh, while we're waiting for that, let's. Okay, so there we go. And this this step, um, so the nice thing about, again, working with E4S on, on one of these uh, Exascale platforms is that um, the build step is, is trivial. It just goes out, gets the cache, pulls it in. In this case, it's actually working with the locally installed one, but it's actually using SPAC to find that. Um, so it's, it's a generalized kind of solution. Um, so that's another advantage of using these these uh, technologies together, is that it's really easy to move from you know one one place to another, because um, SPAC is being the thing that's either you know finding the thing or in installing it or whatever it's doing. Um, okay. So yeah, this takes <laughs> as long as it's going to take to do the run. Let me look ahead real quick to show you what we're going to do. Um, so you know once a once a run once you know, I've convinced you that this thing actually does run, um, the next thing that you want to want to do is kind of look around and, and try to change some things. So um, if you look at the things that are kind of easy to, to change, we just did this as easy examples. Um, there is a um, input file here, which we're going to edit. Um, that is the input file to the code. And uh, there's a couple of things that are spelled out here that you can change in order to change the number of time steps that are run. Um, we can also do things like change the visualization. Okay, so the way that we have this set up is going to do, um, I forget which one of these it does first. Um, it's, I think it's probably doing the volume visualization because it's taking a little longer. Um, but it's easy to kind of switch between these two. Uh, visualizations, and we do that by just changing uh, the script that it runs that that Paraview is going to run in order to um, uh, create the visualization. So those are the kinds of things that are examples in this tutorial that you can go ahead and edit and change just to you know get experience with digging through and 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 running these things. Um, and then you can look at the results again after that. So um, let's take a look at this. So I'm not quite sure why it's taking that long. It's possible, let's see here. So yeah, it's, I ran this yesterday time. as well um, yeah. on the VMs. And I think the VMs just take, just take a little while. Take a little while. Yeah, so if it if it's doing the volume rendering, I I um, post processing, I think you'll see, depending on which, and I apologize, I forget which one it comes up. The volume rendering one takes longer just because it's a longer um, visualization. Um, but it looks like that was the run taking a little while there too. So while we're waiting for this, I can, I, I don't know if you want to do questions or um, should we, I don't know, I encourage you to try that part and then we can, um, let me dig in here. I will get another terminal up. Um, I think that's the volume visualization here. So let's go ahead and take. I'll take a look here. Um, these are these are the steps that we were we were outlining here in the tutorial. So we'll go ahead and take a look at that. Um, oops.
Um, okay, so. David, so I just ran the same a, a example that was written in the readme file and it worked properly. It got me the yeah, I'm not sure cinema why dot IPNB and then I can change the image size and the time to show the first step. Okay, so let me let me just get out of this window and see if I can just restart this thing. I just cut and pasted the commands directly from the readme.txt yeah. in the Pantheon okay. section and it works fine. Yeah, it, these, so let's see. If you just double click on that readme.txt on the desktop, you'll... Yep. Just... Yeah, that one, so... I'm not sure. I'm I'm a little loogie here. Um, Just search for Pantheon. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. It's not. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah. Get up another terminal. All right, let's see. If <clears throat> yeah, so so again, what this what this is doing, it's going to run the simulation, it's going to do the post processing step, create the cinnamon database, and then and, and then show you the result. Um, but let's look at also the um, oops. Okay. <clears throat> so if I go to the inputs directory, um, you'll see that there are, um, we just name these per whatever you're kind of doing. So let's go, if we go into the Nala wind, um, you'll see this YAML file. Um, so what you can do is go in here and then oh, change the termination time. So let, you know, if you wanted to make it run much faster, you could uh, just change this to a one. I guess this was left in a state where it had been changed to uh, 10. Um, so this is now gonna run one time step because um, you know what happens is the, the uh, scripts just kind of copy these into the right place. Um, so that would be an example of how you, whoops, how you would change the, um, how you would change the number of time steps that are run. Um, and this is kind of the, this is the trick, right? So these, these things can be quite complex. And so again, providing the examples lets you kind of run these things and then learn by doing. So you go in there and you might change the time step, you might change the visualization. Um, and again, if you break it, no big deal. Um, so I'm not sure. And yeah, my machine seems to be, uh, so I apologize, my machine seems to be kind of hung right now. Um, but in, anyway, um, uh, So Samir, I don't know. I'm having a little trouble here. Do you want to? So I uh, let me um, just uh, take over right now. And, okay. Uh, yeah. Show this. Uh, if you stop sharing, I'll just uh, start sharing right here. And let me. If you stop sharing, I'll. Uh, 
Okay. So uh, let's just uh, uh, go back to this uh, example. So you are in this uh, Pantheon section of the readme file. All I do is uh, launch Pantheon and I get the Pantheon description. Then let me just uh, look at the results of the example here. I launch this Pantheon notebook and I can run this cell. And you see this simulation, I can change the time step right there. And the image size, and it's all running in a Jupyter notebook in this environment. If I want to look at the examples in the cinema viewer, I can just take this Pantheon uh, cinema view.html and just put it here and cut and paste that. And so here is the viewer. Let me just reduce the image size and uh, change the time step. And you can see the different visualization that we saw before in the Jupyter. So uh, could we just uh, take a minute and have everyone go to the readme.txt and just cut and paste these first three lines and make sure that you also are able to uh, you know, click on the run over here in the Jupyter and also uh, launch the cinema view.html and uh, you are able to change the time and the image size. And can we get some uh, confirmation from uh, some of our participants that they are able to do this with uh, these first three steps? Yes, I'm here. You are? Uh, okay. Uh, David, would you like to say a few words about this particular cinema view? Is uh... David? Yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, would you like to say a few words about this cinema view? Um, yeah, so this is a this is a JavaScript based viewer that we have um, for cinema databases, image image databases in particular. Um, you can this is. You available under the Cinema um, GitHub uh, project, and what we what we do is the idea behind this is you know if you have a big data set, um, capturing these images is a, much, is a much more interactive way to kind of look at the overall data uh, quickly, and you can install this kind of lightweight viewer right next to the images, and um, you know you don't need to do anything other than have a web browser in order to look at your data. So that's the idea behind this viewer. And this is a simple, very lightweight viewer just made for images. Um, so I don't know. And uh, what about this Jupyter so interface? The, yeah, so the Jupyter Notebook, you know, everybody, Jupyter Notebooks are, are a very, now becoming a much more um, common way to both run things and, you know, capture these workflows. Um, and the Ascent team has done a lot to, to integrate um, their technology with, with Jupyter Notebook. Um, and so it's just a really great way to kind of have this stuff available. So this is just a kind of an independent um, way that you can look at this information. Um, but it's really, it's the same stuff. It's accessing the same files. Um, it's just kind of, you know, this is kind of what people are asking for. Um, so it's just, it's just integrated into those workflows as well. And can can we just get an acknowledgement that uh, you are able to launch the Jupyter Notebook and uh, run the cell by clicking this run and you get this visualization as well among the people who are doing the hands-on? Did this work for you with the Jupyter notebook with the run? Worked for me, Craig Bosna says, okay, good. 
and uh, so i had uh, run the i had done the execute over here and i'm over here and i see the results of the execute uh, i think it's done oh it's uh, submitting the run so, yeah, that's, okay it's in the post processing stage there it's in the post processing stage yeah so, so finish this and then it's doing the post processing yeah i apologize it looks like those were left in the vm on this in a state that was you know 10 time steps and then the um volume rendering so if you do like one time step in the um uh, the iso surface view it's it's much quicker so i apologize for that so there okay, we go. There, okay, there we go. Just came out. <laughs> Sorry, that. this is what you were looking to see, right? Yes. Yeah. And exactly. yeah. So so yeah. So what this means was that we ran this and tested it, and we left the time step at ten and the and the more expensive visualization, which was the opposite of kind of what we wanted to do. But um, yeah, if you flip the time down or if you change the uh, simulation to the ISO surface, it'll complete much quicker. Um, so. Um, yeah, so that's the kind of stuff that you can do with with the um, you know with the files that are there, and and you know this this is the example of kind of the, the philosophy behind what we're doing, which is um, it it obviously runs a little uh, runs faster on the um, well actually the the um, yeah I mean the volume rendering is actually kind of expensive, um, so this is this is not crazy, um, but the idea is that this is something that runs. Um, in fact, the, 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 and the overwhelming amount of compute time is going to be the actual running of the simulation and the visualizations. Um, the, the, the cache install and stuff is actually very quick. Um, and um, yeah, so you can, you can change the visualizations. And a lot of these um, have this kind of structure where there's a different visualization in there that you can kind of experiment with. And it gives you a starting point to be able to say, Oh, how do I even begin to understand this whole thing, right? So you you have these easy entry points to the structure of changing things. If you if you um, you know make it unrunnable in some way, just go back and pull it and run it again. You know, you start start clean. And I hope you are all able to also do this execute stage and uh, get this cinema view. And here is the YAML file that uh, we were just talking about and just change the termination time. Yeah, so if you change uh, that to one, then, then it's, yeah. it'll be a lot less. And then CD to this. Well, I would go into, yeah, and I would, I would go into the post-processing, post-submit script. Or post-process directly? Mm -hmm. Well, you can just, be, yeah, so post submit. No, post, post submit. I think sorry. I believe. And then if you, yeah, so if you go down to visualization. Yeah. Nope. There you go. And comment that out. And then uncomment the previous line. Nope. So what this. you're doing here is just changing the script that's run. Right, so we're going to extract sure. contours now. If you run it, it should run pretty quickly. So just so here, yeah, I should type, just run execute. Right, there you go. And this will do one time step and then a less expensive um, visualization. And David, we ran the Nalu wind example yesterday, and that also was taking about three minutes or so. Mm -hmm. So see the, here, there, there you, so that was the one time step, right? So that's, and then the yeah. this is doing contours instead of volume rendering. There it is. So there you go, right? So yeah, apologies, we we left it in the, we left it in the in the long and complicated state rather than the short state. Um, but yeah, so this is the different visualization. This is taking a contour of that same data, um, and. Um, Yes, but that shows you kind of how how these things are easy to kind of edit um, and change. So yeah. So again, what just, again? 
Yeah, so just, just reminding you what's happening here. It's running the simulation. It's writing out um, output files. And then those output files are being pulled into Paraview in a, in a Paraview Python script. Um, Paraview is, is chugging away on the visualization, writing out the different images that you need. And we're constructing the, the cinema database and then looking at it with the viewer. So that's what's happening behind the scenes. So that was actually a good example of changing the files to make it uh, run differently. <laughs> Thanks, Samir. Sorry, I don't, I don't know what's up with my connection here. Oh, no problem. And uh, here is the, sorry, uh, the steps there. Uh, what we did were just go to this uh, examine directory. And then we went to the, the Pantheon tutorial and changed the value over there. To one and again we went to post process and so i am in this directory tutorial x7 post process and then we looked at the post submit dot sh and toggle these two yeah so instead of uh, volume we are getting contours is this uh, okay uh, did Anyone else uh, managed to change the value of termination time to one and then toggle this post submit.sh and uh, go back to this top directory and run execute? Uh, I see Wyatt was able to do that. Let's just give them a, a minute or so. Okay. If they can just uh, take some time to run this. So that uh, the goal would be to get this, this view. This is the comment uncomment for visualization. This is the file. Again, you go to this directory and execute. All the steps are right here. And there it is. Yeah, and the, the other thing, I, I think I said this before, but but the other nice feature about the whole, you know, all the spec and the E4S is that um, to um, if you if you base it on that and everything's working, um, you know, spec can find things or it can pull things or it, it just sort of does that nice bit under the covers of, um, and the script is actually quite similar. Um, you can put in controls to say. You know, build it from scratch. Don't build it from scratch. There are there are ways to do that, but the way that these are constructed now, this is actually just going and getting the cache version, which happens to be on this local machine, and it's really easy to control that. Um, and so that puts the burden. You know, as as the working on the Pantheon workflow, we need to kind of know how that works. But the examples are in there, and it's actually quite a bit that's taken care of in the covers, which is really again, makes this thing usable rather than uh, something that we have to do every time. Um, <clears throat> I see one of the participants said that, uh, Craig said that- Where are we? Here we go. He was able to do this, right? Any, okay, any other users, are, are they having trouble with any of these uh, operations? So 
So from the E4S side, we are, we are making sure that the software stack is consistent, that all the tools are installed properly, and the tools like Paraview are available with the right Python APIs and Jupyter notebooks are working so that the end user does not have to worry about the whole installation of multiple packages and, and dealing with the rest of those things. Well, uh, it, it is uh, past 10, we have been going for two hours and I think it may be time to take a break. So we'll keep this uh, on, but uh, I think we should take a break until say 10.30 yeah. a.m. Pacific time. I have a question here though uh, yeah. for you. So I see that. See. Yeah, I don't, uh, so I'm sorry. Um, resilience. Um, <laughs> Can, can you explain the context for that? Well, I, I guess in the event of the, if something fails, does it retry, does right. it recover in the middle? Um, no, no. Um, again, this is, this is, you know, it's the best case kind of end-to-end -end example that we expect to work. If it fails, um, in fact, we, we do this on our tests is, you know, it, it can fail for so many, num so many reasons that it's really, um, you know, we have to fix it if it if it fails. Um, and um, so, no, it doesn't do that. Um, it's really, you know, again, it's, it's best to think of it as an end and working example that you can dig into in this way. Um, it takes advantage of the caching. It takes advantage of things in order to be useful. Um, but no, it doesn't, it doesn't manage resilience. I mean, that's not so, so I should say that's not to say that if you wanted to do something to manage resilience, that would be fine. The philosophy of what we have now is, you know, simple stuff that works that provides the examples. Um, so if you wanted to have your own kind of set of these and you wanted to publish them and, you know, kind of do that, you could certainly manage them within your own thing, but we don't have any um, underlying uh, infrastructure that would, that would help you with that. Um, so I hope that answers that question. It does, thanks. Mm -hmm. So I guess we can take a break and start again at 10.30 a.m. or Pacific time. 